Okay. I never quite know when the stream starts because there's a delay and it gives me an ad first and takes a second to get started. But I think I'm going right now. Um, uh, I'm going to wait like five more minutes to really get started since I said I'd start at one. Um, but, you know, I'll just get the stream started so people know to, to check it out, to log in. Make a nice document that tells everyone that I'm not quite ready to get going yet. Not terrible handwriting.
okay. Uh, this is probably just going to get started now. Uh, I will be recording this and hopefully backing it up on uh, YouTube as long as nothing freezes or goes wrong. Um, but yeah, so I've just been getting a couple of requests here and there from uh, some students and other folks uh, just about a few extra things to cover. Uh, this is So today is going to be uh, completely unrequired stuff. This is just mostly a look at ZBrush, actually. Uh, I know a number of people have expressed interest uh, moving past this class at working in character art um, and just in modeling in general. And ZBrush really is a pretty wonderful tool uh, to take your stuff to the next level. Um, you still end up using Maya quite extensively or Max or whatever it is that you use for your, your base mesh modeling. Um, but I can show today ZBrush can really get you pretty far um, on your own, especially if you have something like Topo Gun, uh, which I can show today too, possibly. Um, because that kind of allows you to redraw topology after creating a uh, sculpture st straight in ZBrush. Um, it's a pretty cool pipeline. Uh, Maya also has a whole retopology set now too that I've only used once, so I, I'm not going to demo it today because I kind of forget how to use it, and I don't want to fumble through it. I'd rather figure it out and get back to you guys. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, please obviously I will uh, please let me know. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, got it open in my other window. I always have trouble getting it to work right or seeing it properly. Um, let's see, I've got viewer list and okay, there's the chat room. Okay, cool. So, I guess it's gonna be you know this is gonna be a pretty basic introduction to ZBrush. So anyone who's here to see a ton of sculpting, uh, I might not get to that today, or I might not get to that for another half hour, hour or so. Um, the first request was just uh, just to show ZBrush as a whole and how the menu works. Because uh, it is, you know, first thing you see is this is this is basically the launch screen for ZBrush. It's very different from Maya. Uh, when you open Maya, it looks like this for the most part. Um, you still have your workspace right in the middle. I think pretty much every piece of software has that kind of as the default. You have your list of objects on the left side, you've got your attributes and channels and everything over on your right side, you've got your timeline down here. Uh, most of your menu, actually pretty much your entire menu in Maya is through uh, these bars up here. Um, and ZBrush is somewhat similar, but the menu, it, it's much more customizable. And I think once you realize that, it's not nearly as intimidating as it might look initially. Uh, so whenever you launch, you initially get this uh, light box, I think it's called light box or spotlight window. Uh, and this is basically a file browser. Uh, by default, it will always give you these starting options. Uh, I'm going to do this again, and we'll work with the Dynamesh sphere later. But for now, uh, I usually just hide this right off the bat. So the first weird thing that you'll notice about ZBrush is, so you see over here, by default, your tool window comes up. And kind of your tool window is sort of everything. This is how you load uh, files. This is how you save files. Um, <clears throat> Let me see, I gotta close something over in the other window, sorry. And. <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of your file stuff is done through this. And once you get a file open, it's gonna bring up uh, one more. It's gonna extend this whole window. Uh, but so, yeah, the first thing that you'll notice is you have this simple brush, and when you draw, you kind of get this weird, nonsensical thing. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And you can't rotate around anything. Uh, alt doesn't really do anything like it does in Maya, control. Uh, well, Alt actually gives you the opposite, the inverse. And you can see it almost looks like it's this 3D thing. Um, but this is sort of a remnant of ZBrush past. Um, this is basically the 2.5D brushes. Uh, so you can pretty much ignore this when you're starting. So if you want to bring in a model and sculpt on it, you first have to bring the model in. Um, so I'm going to hit uh, control N to start this over. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at the tool. Uh, panel over here. Uh, the first thing that you would want to do, if you already have a file, uh, which you would not if it's the first time you're doing this, uh, but if you did, you would hit load tool, and right away you get uh, it takes you to um, Pixelogic ZBrush 4 R7, that's the one I'm working on, and tools. I actually like to save my files by project, so I would go to, say, uh, Mikhail, uh, it's, it's the name of the artist whose character I'm modeling right now. Uh, and I have like a Z, to Z tools folder. 
So like in Maya, how you save a .ma or a .mb file, uh, in ZBrush, you'll be saving a ZTL file or a ZTool. Uh, it's a little bit different because uh, there are a couple options, um, but just it's good to keep in mind that you actually do everything through the tool window. Don't go through file because uh, that saves like a whole document, which is another thing entirely. Um, so let's just load um, the most recent version of this. I think this is still a work in progress. Um, so the first thing you have to do is actually click and drag the object out into your window, into your workspace. <clears throat> and once you do that, you see up, you'll look up here, and this is kind of your indicator of which tool is kind of active. Uh, so I'm still in draw mode, so if I keep doing this, it's just going to keep opening instances, and only one of them is really the 3D one. So I'm going to hit Control N just to kind of clean that space out, um, and I'm going to drag again. So I'm clicking and dragging. If I hold shift, it'll snap it, you'll see, uh, to that um, to that axis. Is there no sound? Okay, there is. I just checked. I just turned audio on and I was getting sound. One sec, everyone. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so let me start that over. Just hitting uh, Control New or Control N to clear my palette. Uh, so ZBrush works a little different. So there's there's like a 3D space and a 2.5D space. I don't know. I don't fully understand uh, all of the complexities of that. Um, but all that you really need to know is you're going to load your Z tool or uh, otherwise you might uh, import, but so we're gonna start with loading an existing one and you could load um, a demo if you want to follow along. Uh, so you hold this out, hit shift, and then you have two options. You can either hit edit, which is gonna make the object active, or you can hit T, which does the same thing. And now I can actually work on this model. So navigation is a little bit different from Maya. Uh, so for this, you basically wanna click and drag anywhere that is not on a model that's just on the window and it'll rotate your model for you. Uh, you can hold shift to snap to different views because uh, there's not really different cameras the way that there is in Maya it's just this one workspace uh, and then you can hit alt and click outside to sort of pan around and then the weirdest one that now I'm very used to but takes a little getting used to is the zooming in and out so what you want to do for that is alt click and get into this moving thing and without unclicking let go of alt and now when you drag in and out it'll zoom in and out it's pretty strange up front uh, you get used to it pretty quickly though uh, and also just uh, FYI I am working on a with a, a tablet the Wacom 4 uh, Intuos 5 actually I think ZBrush is definitely a tablet kind of software you can use a mouse but it is pretty challenging because uh, the, the big advantage of ZBrush is its pressure sensitivity with its brushes, um, both in drawing and painting. Um, so anyway, now we have this object here. And you'll notice when I rotate around, it kind of has sort of a weird different orientation from how Maya works. So the first thing that I do every time I open is just switch to rotate on Y axis. Uh, and it changes it from sort of the tumbling rotation just to a more typical Maya rotation. Uh, and I think 3D Studio Max works the same way. It's kind of holds, it, it keeps your camera sort of facing up in the Y axis. Um, so it's much easier to kind of get around. Um, and that being said, sometimes you might want to switch to this in case you want to like get a certain angle. And, you know, it's a lot like painting where your, your strokes really make a difference. So right, let me, you know, so you might want to actually put it in this orientation because you wanted to draw a stroke out that was kind of like this might be easier to do it left to right than it is to do it side to side or up to down up and down um, so anyway I'm just going back to my view here um, so now that we have the model loaded we see that the tool window expands quite a bit our main thing to look at is subtools so I'm gonna just click on this and it'll expand and this is pretty much a good example of every menu system and every menu set in ZBrush um, in ZBrush you can each, each uh, menu is basically 
grouped into a tab like this. So I can actually click on this and maximize and minimize my tool. Say I wanted to work with some plugins too, I can click on the plugin menu, click this little icon over here, and just snap it over here. Um, and then you also have uh, a window over here where you can see I've actually already stored a bunch of things that I use pretty frequently. And if you want to keep multiple ones open at the same time, you just hold shift while you click on them. Which is not working right now, okay. Or no, it's, is it control? No, I guess it just doesn't want me to do it right now. Anyway, you can always move these around to different parts of the uh, menu just by clicking here. So ZBrush is super customizable and modular, which is really nice. And if you want to get rid of it, you just click on it once. And it'll go away. So I also have a couple custom things down here, and I'll get to that soon. These are just tools that I use a lot and brushes that I use, uh, so I have docked them down here. Uh, so let's see. Uh, first, I'll look at Subtool. So this is pretty much the same thing as the Outliner in Maya. Uh, you have all these different objects that you can toggle between, and you can also click the Solo button here to just look at the one active thing at a time. So sometimes you just need to isolate one thing, so you're going to sculpt on that for a little while. Um, uh, it's very similarly to Maya, hitting at the F key will frame everything. Uh, it'll actually frame, I think it toggles between framing the whole model and framing the individual selected if you keep tapping it over and over again. Um, and then one other way, if you want to keep this all hidden and just want to have a big workspace, you can hit the N key, the letter N, and it'll bring up all of your subtools here so you can toggle between them that way. And then one more way to switch between subtools is to actually hold the Alt key and click on an object, and it becomes active. And you'll notice things get a little bit brighter. Uh, another thing you can do is hit uh, Shift F, which will activate wireframe. You can also just click on wireframe. Um, I guess it's yeah, this the polyframe. You can click on that to toggle, but the hotkey for that is Shift F. And it'll only show you the wireframe on the active one, so sometimes that's a good way to quickly check if you don't see a difference in the brightness because you've done a bunch of painting. Uh, but you can see holding Alt and clicking goes between all the different subtools. Uh, you can also turn individual subtools on and off if you just want to isolate a handful of them. Say I want to work on the head, but I wanted the context of everything else, I can do that. This little brush here, if you have poly paint on your object already, and I can show you if you go down to um, texture map. So I'm going to hold shift actually here to make sure that it opens both of these and doesn't close this. Or not texture map, sorry, poly paint. You'll see that right now I have this colorized channel. And I actually have this dock down here because I like to toggle between it that way sometimes. Um, but that means that there is color on this. And I'll switch over to a different material real quick. And I'll get into this, what I'm doing here in a bit. Um, but let's solo this out and see. So what it's going to do is toggle between poly paint and uh, just no, and just whatever my default material is. So right now you can see I can switch to whatever color I want. And it's not actually like applying that. This is more applying it to the material on the material level. And then this is turning on like an active texture. So you can see when I turn this on, it overrides whatever I had over here. <coughs> But that's probably a subject for another time. Right now, I just want to make sure I get through all the basics. Um, so let's see. What else do we have over here? So I, some of this might be a little bit... Um, I'm kind of winging it on this and just kind of going through one thing at a time. So again, if there's any questions about anything, definitely don't hesitate to ask. Uh, otherwise, I'm just kind of, kind, of, kind of go through one thing at a time and just tell you what that thing does. Right. But yeah, so you see within here you have things, just your typical, uh, you can rename it. So ZBrush again does things differently. You don't double click on the word to rename. You got to click rename with the object selected. Um, you can toggle between all high resolution and all low resolution versions of your mesh. Uh, as you can see, I have multiple versions and you can see up here with my active points. There's total points, which will show you the total of everything in your entire tool, the whole Z tool, which is the sum of all of your subtools. Um, but then you also have your active points, which changes depending on which subdivision you're looking at. 
So before I get to the rest of this, I will talk about subdivisions. So this model already has multiple subdivisions because I've been working on it for a little while. Um, and to look at those, again, I want to shift click so I can have my subtools open and my geometry. The geometry tab houses all of the information and details and modification stuff that you can do to the geometry itself. Um, so the best, the closest thing to wireframe is just using the uh, draw polyframe over here, which again, shift F kind of toggles between. Uh, it's not, there's not really a see-through wireframe like there is in Maya. Uh, it's always this solid image in ZBrush. It just renders things differently. Um, but you can see the wireframe this way. It's, but it's, it's basically the same as the wireframe on shaded, like in Maya. Um... All right, so most important thing, which is why it's at the top of the geometry menu, is your subdivision levels. Uh, so right now, you can see we're at subdivision level one, which has 1,288 active points. If I hit the D key, D is the hotkey for toggling, <coughs> or for uh, advancing through your subdivision levels, and then Shift D will go down. Um, and then Control D will actually create a new subdivision from uh, but you have to do it from whatever your highest is. It basically it's it's basically running a smooth operation. But the great thing, I mean, the power of ZBrush is the fact that it stores all of these subdivisions. So in Maya, you know, once you've subdivided, there is like this the the, the option to up and uh, to increase and decrease your subdivision level if you don't delete history once you've done a smooth. But if you start extruding and doing modeling on that and stuff, it's gonna get it's gonna break everything. But ZBrush is designed to actually handle that. Um, so, you know, so I can make like a big change to this and go to the move brush and, you know, it's going to update it to the whole model. So let me undo that. So yeah, hitting D will go all the way up through subdivision. Um, so much like Maya, there's, there's hotkeys for almost everything in ZBrush, but there's also almost always a menu item for it as well. Uh, and I think one of the challenging things with ZBrush though, is sometimes those menu items are really hard to find or they're buried and you do kind of have to know a lot of hotkeys to get around it. So it definitely takes some practice. It takes some Googling early on. Um, it took me quite a while to really get ZBrush down. Um, once you get it down, though, it really is a lot of fun to work with. Uh, and it actually, though initially I think it probably feels very unintuitive, it starts to feel very intuitive uh, after a while. All right, so now we have subdivisions. So that is all high, all low. I can click on that, and you can see I can click all low takes a second because I have every sub tool uh, then click all high let me see we go back and forth between those two so I'm gonna solo this out again and then obviously I can duplicate I don't ever use the copy and paste uh, but you can duplicate uh, which will just give you a duplicate obviously um, which since I made that duplicate I'm gonna delete that duplicate now um, which is right here it's gonna always warn you this is not undoable. Uh, everything else is pretty much everything else is undoable. Deleting an object is not, so that's why they bring this window up, window up to make sure that you don't delete something you don't mean to. So I don't care. I know that that's something I wanted to get rid of. Um, so ZBrush handles importing a little bit differently, and I'll get to that now because we're about to hit the append tool, and this is a pretty useful tool. There's two things to think of. Say that you have a new object for this scene that you want to import. You have like a new base mesh for the hair and you just want to get rid of this hair for some reason. Um, <clears throat> you have two things you can do. When you use import in ZBrush, it's going to import it and into the current subtool end, like the Z tool and subtool. So if I hit import on it, and that's basically because they want you to be able to import UVs. So say this was a non-UV'd object and I UV'd it in ZBrush or Maya and I wanted to import those UVs. It's very important that I make sure that I don't move the object in space at all in Maya. I just do my UVs, then I export that model and then I would hit import. And let's see if I actually have, I probably actually have that because I do usually do that process. Uh, hair, let's see, hair medium. I think I did a retopology. Okay, so this is telling me that my topology is actually different so the model that I'm trying to import is not going to be just the UVs for this it's something else so I'm gonna hit no for now and hit undo 
because uh, I did not want to do that. Um, but say I had some other shape that I wanted to bring in. So I, the thing that you would do is I always go to the PolyMesh 3D object up here. Because um, basically I can't import into an empty into an empty space here, into an empty subtool. I'm going to have to import it into like a base subtool and then append it to the other subtool, uh, to the other Z tool. So with this one active, it could be any of these shapes. So like when you click this, I could, I could make it a sphere if I wanted to. Uh, I just want to click import. And this is how you bring in like an OBJ or something like that. So let's grab something from uh, one of these projects. So I'll bring in the head demo. Uh, and then it asks, so this comes up because I must have had a couple of triangles or, I oh know I had a uh, n-gon in this file. So I'm just going to tell it to do quads and triangles. It's going to kind of retopologize it for me. Uh, so this is like that really early, okay, you can see. This is one of the really early demos that I made for you guys when we were kind of making the model for the base mesh. Um, so now that that's imported, you see that it makes a new subtool here that's empty. So if I go back to my... Uh, Snow Girl subtool, I can now append that to this scene. Now we're just pretending like this is something that I'm going to want, but obviously it's not. So when you hit append, you get basically your quick pick, which is all of the defaults and anything new that you've brought in. And then this is like the 3D meshes, which is just every default shape that you could possibly uh, want that comes with the ships with ZBrush. Uh, so head demo we see is the one that we want. And you can see it has added it to our list down here. If I unsolo this, you see now that is in the scene. And I modeled it different orientations, so it's backwards right now. Uh, so that actually brings up something good, which is I can modify that. So a couple different ways I can do that. <laughs> Maya lets you use something called, uh, so you have these move, scale, and rotate tools. So if I hit, uh, and it's pretty, I think it's the same as, let's see, it's W is move. Yeah, and it brings up the transpose tool. So basically the transpose tool is how you move everything in real time, like in the workspace. Um, but you also have the option to go down to um, I think deformation and you can do everything here. And this is actually, I like this a lot of the times more because it's more precise. Um, I'm still dying for ZBrush to add just a typical, um, basically to add this, because this makes a whole lot more sense and is much easier to work with than the way ZBrush does it. But I don't know if that's ever gonna happen. I guess we will see. Um, but for now, I can show you how this works. So transpose works by whatever your active window is. If you draw in an empty space and drag out, you get this transpose line. And if I hold shift, it'll snap to, I think every 15 degrees or so. So we get 45, I guess probably 33, yeah. Uh, so we'll go straight out. And this allows me to do things like scale, move, or rotate. So say I wanted to rotate this, to put it in place, I just click on that out, outer one, and it's going to pivot from the interior. It's going to pivot from whatever end you select. So if I wanted to do it this way, I can rotate it that way. And then this one is actually going to rotate it on uh, both of the axes at the same time or the, I'm sorry, the opposite axis. So you can click on that and rotate it that way. Um, and show you scale, same kind of thing. It's gonna pivot from here and scale from wherever this point is. Uh, and I can drag that point around by clicking on the outer orange line. You'll see it kind of snaps back into place, um, but I can now move that around if I want. Um, I can move the whole line around if I want this way, or I can just move the outer line out. So then the inner line is actually the one that allows you to make the change. The outer line is just sort of placing the transpose tool. The inner one, the little inner circle here is the one that actually makes a change. You can see I can drag out. Um, and you can see, I mean, you're probably thinking already like, okay, well, this is really um, not very precise. Um, same with rotation. You know, I can go to the top here. And one, another hotkey is P. P goes between uh, perspective and non and like orthographic view. So sometimes maybe when you're rotating, you want to do like an orthographic view. Uh, so with rotation, you'll notice if I hold shift, there we go. Actually, it's working right now. It used to do a thing where it would flip the whole model on that last one. 
But yeah, so same thing. So you can hold shift to rotate. It's going to go around that pivot. Um, but if you wanted to just do it from a central pivot point, I can go back to my draw mode and I can go to rotate on, I think I want the Y axis. So here's where we get into some annoying, like teeny tiny little buttons over here. You can see that I can toggle which axis I'm going to rotate or scale on. Then I have a slider here, so I can just say 180 degrees. But again, unlike Maya, where you can just type in any value you want, you ha you're kind of limited by 180 here. Oh, and I have auto save on. Um, but you know, if I wanted to do my size, say I had to bring in three things, and I needed to make sure that they all went up by like 300%, then at least I, even though I have to do it one at a time, you know, I can scale each of them one, two, three times and go through and that's more precise than using the actual scale tool up here it's not perfect but it is better than nothing um the rest of these we're not going to worry about they give they become useful when you get into sculpting i'm not going to talk about them quite yet um, but size and rotate it's good to know that these are here um because i kind of just forgot that this existed for a while when i was first learning and just kept using transpose and like things just aren't nearly as precise this way and things can get off centered um, one last thing while we're here though I just want to bring up that hitting the X key toggles working in mirror mode um, so this is true for sculpting for pretty much everything so right now I'm gonna hit let's just to show that I'm gonna hit control D a couple times to subdivide this mesh and uh, hitting S gives you the toggle for size of brush uh, I'm still in rotate mode, so I'm going to hit W to go, or Q to go back to draw mode. And you'll see if I hit S, it brings up this little toggle to allow me to change my brush size. I can also do that up here, and I can change my focal shift, which is basically the fall off. So you'll see this is sort of the softness of the actual brush itself. So you can see with uh, hitting toggling between X, we get. Um, I'm going to go to my standard brush just by hitting B and then S. I'll get to this later, B, S, T. Um, so now I can draw in, and then I hit Alt to go in. But I can draw in mirror mode now, which is nice. And then if I hit X again, and I want to do some, uh, you know, this cheek was really big for some reason and bigger than the other one, or maybe this nostril goes out a little bit, um, I can do that. So I'm going to undo all that. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is ZBrush actually keeps a history for every individual subtool, which is really fantastic. Um, it also is a RAM hog, so if you are going to get into ZBrush and say you're building a new computer soon or buying a new computer, if you're interested in ZBrush, put as much RAM as you can in there and make sure that you install the 64-bit version of ZBrush. Uh, until, what, like a year or two ago, there was only a 32-bit version. We were limited by 4 gigs of RAM, which was a nightmare. Um, wasn't bad for most things, but sometimes, especially like when you deal with like photogrammetry and trying to bring in big models, it becomes literally impossible to do uh, once the file size gets to a certain size. So anyway, it also stores all this history, but it's really cool because you can just drag through and see everything that you've done. And that's true, uh, and it'll save a different history bar for literally every subtool in your tool. So you can see I can go up to the face here and I don't have solo on, so let's go to the face. And, you know, I could do some sculpting on this. And see each thing that I do, I get a new timeline for that object, uh, which is really cool. Uh, it gives you a lot of freedom to really work on a bunch of stuff at the same time and still have the ability to go back and iterate on that. Um, it will You will lose this when you uh, save and reopen everything. Uh, it does not store when you do save as. Um, and again, remember, you're not going to use the file save as because this saves like a lot of extra stuff that you don't need. All you need is the subtool. Um, so anyway, let's continue through. Um, <clears throat> so let's take the um, these, for example. These are like the little buckles on her uh, jacket. Say I needed to work on these separately for some reason. Uh, or actually the glove I think will be a better example. I'm going to solo the gloves out. So you can see uh, when I hit F, this one's all one color and this one's different colors. And the reason for that is that this one, these are multiple uh, poly groups. 
So ZBrush lets you kind of split things up even further. Okay, sorry, I got some weird notice. Uh, on Twitch, I'm not sure what that was. Okay, so it lets you split things up even further within. So you can keep your subtools kind of baked here, um, but then you also ha have these poly groups that you can create. Um, so let's look down here and try to find our polygroups menu, which is right here. So I'll hold shift and open that. <clears throat> we get a couple options. Uh, so we can auto group, which is just going to basically, it, it's kind of like the mesh separate in ZBrush or in Maya, where it looks for contiguous meshes. And if there are no vertices or anything that are merged together, it creates a group for each uh, island. <clears throat> uh, you can also just do, um, so I've toggled a few, I've put a bunch of these down here and you'll see when I hover, they kind of update over here too. Um, these are just the ones that I use the most. There's group visible, which is if I have it visibility on, then I can create a new poly group. Uh, auto groups, groups it like that. And then if I want, I can hold control and drag to drag a mask out and do group masked. So anything that's masked now, so now each glove is individually uh, set. So the reason I'm going into this right now is because this ties directly into the split menu up here in Subtools. Um, so you can do group split, which is basically means poly groups, uh, or I could hide part of this object, um, which I'll get into in a minute, and I can split it that way. Uh, or I can split to parts, which I'm actually not sure exactly how that works. Um, but that reminds me, in ZBrush, every single tool uh, with the exception of a few plugins, because I don't think they were ever documented properly, uh, if you hold the control button while hovering, it gives you the, it, it tells you exactly what that tool does, and it also tells you the button path to it. So like, up here, there's a button path to it that's hard to see, but it's under draw Z. So if I wanted to access this in the menu, even all these things, I can access through this, through the actual menu up here. Um, so yeah, that's a really useful thing to know because uh, anytime you know if you're obviously I'm not gonna be able to cover everything today there's gonna be a ton of stuff that I don't get to because ZBrush takes a very long time to really properly get to know um, it's time well spent in my opinion uh, and hopefully in the next week or so I'll be able to do some real sculpting in this to show you guys like just what it's like to do a project in here um, but one thing at a time uh, one sec I need some coffee Okay, um, all right, so I know I got a little distracted there. Uh, so we're talking about group split. So what that's gonna do is it's going to take these this poly group and split it by subtools. Uh, so I'll just hit that real quick. And again, it's telling me you can't undo this. Are you sure you wanna do it? And yes, I do. Uh, so now I have each mitten is its own subtool. Uh, and if I wanted to change that back, I can do this and I'm going to turn on visibility on everything and you'll see with all the eyes here selected I can actually click on the active eye and it'll make everything disappear except for that one object and then I can click on just the eye for this so that's a good way to clear out your selection so now I have my two gloves and I'm going to merge these back together so I'm going to use the merge and I'm hitting sh I'm holding shift while doing this too because otherwise you'll see they kind of automatically close when you open a new one, which I don't really like. So holding shift will open multiple ones at the same time. So what I'm gonna wanna do is merge down. I can also do merge visible. Um, but the thing to keep in mind when you do this is your subdivisions. Because when you merge, you have to make sure that the two objects that you merge have the same number of subdivisions. Otherwise, it's just going to take whatever their currently active subdivision level is, and it's just going to bake it as subdivision level one, because it doesn't really have any other option. Uh, so these both, because we just split them, both have su five subdivisions. So I can just make sure that I'm at the highest subdivision for both of them, and I am. I'm going to do merge down, and again, not an undoable, op undoable operation, just like everything else. And now we have them back together and we still have our subdivisions retained. If I had done that with both of them at subdivision one, I believe it would have actually uh, just frozen them at subdivision one and we would have lost all of our detail. 
Um, so another thing that makes this whole subtool thing or this whole polygroup thing useful is I can go to, let's do auto groups real quick. I can make selections on these in a number of different ways to work on just one of them at a time. So say I wanted to come in and I wanted to do some sculpting on this glove. You know, I wanted to add some wrinkles kind of coming out. Again, I'm just gonna turn this influence up. But like, ah, shoot, I'm going into this and I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to sculpt on this one piece, but I don't want to split the gloves up. There's two different things you can do. So there is mask by poly groups, which I've docked down here, and you can get to that through brush auto mask by poly group. So I can go up to my brush and I can go to auto masking and I can access it here, but I've docked it down here. Again, I'll show you how to do that soon. Um, so I can go all the way up to 100, and what that does is whatever the first polygroup is that I touch, it's only going to influence that polygroup. So if I start painting on here, you know, I can go all over this at full res at uh, full intensity, and it's not going to affect the other polygroups. Um, so that can be really useful if you just want to come in and paint some. Again, you got to be careful that you do it in the right order. Um, but then it also allows you to do things like mask everything. So <clears throat> this is again getting into ZBrush having a crazy amount of sub uh, hotkeys, uh, and all of these things are documented. So if you don't want to go through this whole video again, or if you missed this video, or if you just watched it once and don't want to watch it again, because uh, I can see this getting kind of boring the second or third time, um, there's a lot of documentation on this. So just look these things up. Um, see, Pixelogic does a really good job of documenting all of this. Uh, there's also ZBrush Central, obviously, uh, but that's more for showcasing work. So anyway, uh, holding Control and Shift will allow you to isolate an object. Or I'm sorry, wait. Yeah. And then if you Control Shift click off the object, it brings everything back. So it's gonna Control Shift click. It's gonna isolate that one poly group. And so that could be nice if, uh, rather than doing this mask by poly group, you just wanted to mask it yourself. Um, one of the main brushes in Maya, so when you hold control down, you can see that the brush palette up here changes to uh, mask pen. So this does two things. If I'm hovering on an object, I will draw a mask onto it. And if I do it from the off of an object, it will drag a mask over it. So you can see it'll just mask by whatever your selection is. Uh, you can also always say you had like something really specific you wanted to get, just like Photoshop, I could click on this with control down and I could go to mask lasso instead of mask pen. And this gives me a more uh, customizable mask system. And this one you can see it doesn't it never paints on it because it's just a specific lasso tool. So sometimes you might want to like mask uh, maybe the eyes so you could sculpt uh, sculpt the brows out from that or something like that. And then hitting control and clicking off of it will invert your selection. So let's put some eyes on this glove real quick. Alrighty. I'm gonna get rid of this yellow because it's funky looking. I'm gonna switch this over to wax. Um, yeah, so masking you can see it just it freezes whatever is currently selected, which can be really useful. Now we have kind of the beginnings of a creepy eye on this glove. Who wouldn't want that? Um, and masking is its own menu too. So like if you don't want to do the control click off here, there's also, you can go to the masking menu and you can just do uh, inverse. You can blur your mask, which will just soften it. Uh, you can grow the mask, which will increase its influence, but uh, it doesn't seem to want to really grow much right now probably because it's so soft. Uh, you can sharpen the mask back. Maybe growing now will be a little more obvious. Uh, and keep blurring, or you can just clear the whole mask. Um, and then this also gives you all these different options too for how you can mask. So one nice thing to do is like, uh, I do I use this a lot, is I'll mask by cavity. And that gives you these nice crevices and stuff that are masked off. And that can just allow you to then come in and paint and do all kinds of weird stuff to the model. Um, and you can adjust your cavity profile. You can mask by ambient occlusion. I wouldn't recommend 
this because for some reason mask by cavity pretty much does the same thing it's very very close to how ao works um masking by ao takes forever it takes a really long time um so i try to avoid that um then uh, some of the other things that you can do, you can mask by smoothness, which can be somewhat unpredictable, but can give you, like, say if you're just going for noise on, like, a weird scaly creature sometimes, you can just kind of mask by smoothness. A lot of times this stuff becomes useful when you're trying to actually paint things. You know, it allows you to sort of paint some darkness and bake some shadows and stuff into it. Um, mask by peaks and valleys can actually be a really good way to clean up uh, messy scan data and stuff like that. Um, so it can kind of allow you to like it's not showing it well here but sometimes it can allow you to just sort of isolate those peaks and smooth them out so now if i were to do it we're going to lose a lot of that so i can kind of keep smoothing those uh peaks and valleys um but yeah getting back to all right i've gotten pretty far ahead of myself sorry uh, so it's just there's a lot of tools so that's how masking works uh, i'm going to go back to uh the mask pen tool that's the default Again, I'm holding control and clicking on this to shift to that. So I guess I might as well talk about brushes while we're here. Um, everything, every single manipulation that you make in ZBrush is done through a brush. And that goes for sculpting, that goes for painting, that goes for everything. Um, I guess the, the only time that that's not true is transpose. So technically I could mask all of this off and I can go to my transpose and I can just move the unmasked stuff so that is one way to manipulate that is not a brush but I believe that that is the that and like the scale stuff that we looked at over in deformation but basically think of the brushes as doing everything um, you're not going to do like vertex selection necessarily the way uh, that you would in Maya. Uh, there is a Z modeling tool now that kind of allows you to use a lot of similar tools to Maya, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, so by default, you have, you know, when you click on this, you get a whole bunch of brushes. And if you get on ZBrush Central or Pixelogic site, there's even more brushes that you can download and you can load here. Um, but uh, one of the nice things here is we have another really great hotkey system for brushes. So we bring that up just by hitting B. And then every single brush has a one to two letter uh, hotkey associated with it. And you kind of learn these over time. So like standard is BST. And they try to keep it pretty um, logical. Um, let's see. I use, the ones that I use a lot are standard, so B to bring up brush, then S to narrow it down to the uh, S thing starting with S. And then you can see the next letter it's going to get me whatever other tools. So say I wanted the snake hook brush, I would then hit H. So SH is snake tool, which allows me to kind of, it's like the move tool, but it's just a much more focused and highly influenced, influential brush. Um, let's see. Uh, BCB brings up clay buildup, which I probably actually use this more than I use standard. And this just allows me, right, let's go to the wax. Kind of, it's, it's very, very reminiscent of traditional uh, clay sculpting. So you're kind of laying out a tube of clay one at a time. The buildup element of this means that I can, in one click, just keep dragging and it'll keep building up influence. Uh, whereas the regular clay tubes brush, I get one height and no matter how many times I go over it, it's never gonna go higher than that. So that can be pretty useful too. Um, and then there's just the regular clay brush, which is BCL, which is clay. And this just gives you like more of a soft sort of clay. So it's still that sort of tube shape, but it's a much softer shape. Uh, again, holding alt to kind of go in a little bit. And clay is another one that is not built up by default. So it'll just never go, and no matter how, how many times I go over this, it's going to just influence it that amount unless I the only way to go in is to if I keep clicking. So I'm clicking multiple times now to get in further. And let's undo some of that. Um, let's see. Another very useful one is the move brush. So there's two different kinds of move. There's BMB, I think? No, BMV. They actually changed it. So that's move is MV. And this one will just move big swatches like that. Um, 
For some reason, there's no fall off on this. I guess I gotta. This might have been one of the ones that I. Okay, there we go. I think I was showing you fall off with the move tool active. So it's big, big changes. A lot of the times you want to use this one on the lowest subdivision level to just kind of move. You know, say that I really wanted this one to be bigger and I wanted this thumb to kind of be a little bit bigger. It's just going to move it out from wherever you had it. Now when I go up, you see it's applied all these things. Uh, another really important one is holding shift will always go to the smooth brush. Uh, while holding shift, you can change it to something else. I wouldn't recommend doing that. I would just keep it as smooth all the time. And then that does this. So my pipeline, a lot of the time, is actually using clay, clay buildup and then smoothing it. For whatever reason, that's just kind of what I got used to doing, and I really like working that way. Um, so let's put like a little eye on here again. Eyes are fun to do. Or how about an ear? Let's do an ear real quick. Ears can be kind of weird to do. So we got this little guy. Holding Alt to kind of push in. Might need another subdivision on it. But yeah, and then you can kind of start to smooth it out a little bit. You get the idea. I'm not really gonna take the time to sculpt a full ear here, but um, <clears throat> yeah. So I like the, the clay buildup gives you because it mostly because it gives you the option to um, really push things pretty far just in a couple strokes. Uh, standard can do the same, but I like having that tube for some reason. There's no real reason. It's just for me that makes the most sense. Uh, you kind of get some. I get shapes that I don't want a lot of the times when working with standard brush. Um, when I do work with the standard brush, I'll usually set the influence down pretty considerably. Uh, let's do an eye over here with the standard brush. Um, so it's kind of harder to get those sharp shapes. The thing I like about clay tubes is you can get a sharp shape that you then smooth quite a bit. Get the brow up here. So yeah, I might still have to go up a little bit. Um, So you can kind of get those sharp shapes in here too just by kind of changing the size of your brush. But it, I, I find it more challenging to work this way. Whereas clay tubes, I just kind of I get shapes I want much quicker. Um, anyway, it's up to you. I think it's fun to just experiment with a bunch of stuff. Um, let's see, there's one other brush. Uh, I like to use the Damien Standard, which comes by default now. So that is BDS. Uh, I think the guy who made it must have been named Damien. Uh, and this allows you to really carve shapes out. So when you really want to sharpen the edge of something, or say you have like, sometimes it works really well for like defining cloth. Uh, standard is actually really good for doing cloth wrinkles too. I can show you that. So like, say we wanted to, yeah, I kind of already started to do it over here. Like, you know, I want some wrinkles coming in here, just holding Alt and coming back in. But say I had like a really sharp wrinkle or something. Then I'll usually, you know, for a wrinkle, you probably want to smooth the ends because it's not going to stay sharp all the way through. Um, so Damien Standard can give you some interesting stuff for folds. Uh, but again, you're probably going to want to work with the smooth brush a lot with that. Uh, it can get a little bit weird and out of control. Uh, if you get to, like, edges, it can do some weird stuff. It starts to pull it from the other end. So you got to be careful with that. Um, one more brush that I use a lot that's very similar to the Damien Standard is the Orb Crack Brush. And you have to download this one. If you just Google it, it'll be like the first thing that comes up. Um, but the difference, so you can see with Damien Standard, it actually has a brush attribute. And I'm not going to get too deep into these attributes, but um, I can dock it over here. There's actually an attribute in here. Um, I can't remember where it is. But it actually pinches it a little bit too. So we get the sharp line. But it's pinching it in just a tiny bit too. Whereas if I go to the B O is B, uh, orb, this one gives me a really sharp line that just pushes it down. But this one's really good. It's called the orb crack because it was kind of designed for like creating like a rocky, cracky 
look on, you know, making something look kind of like stone, maybe. It's a really nice way to block some cracks into something. Uh, and then you can come in with, like, the, um, the mallet brush and sort of harden those, kind of just randomize it, sort of make it look a little more organic. Vary the width a little bit. Mallet brush just sort of flattens things. Well, most of the brushes kind of give you a visual indication of what they're going to do. Um, one last one that's really cool is the H polish. So that one I think is just BH. Um, so this one kind of depends on how hard you're pushing, uh, but it's basically going to polish and flatten based off of the normal angle that you first select. So like if I select it right here, it's almost like a planar cut. And you can get some really interesting shapes this way. Uh, it's a really cool way to do like a malleted look, like like if you're doing like a sword or something like that. You wanted it to be kind of a rough looking uh, hammered metal kind of look or something like that. Um, you can get some pretty interesting looks this way. <clears throat> I like to use this a lot for more cartoony characters, so <clears throat> gives you kind of an interesting look for that. Um, let's see, what else? So those are the main ones. Um, again, I'm not going to get too much into the uh, all the different uh, things you can get into here right now. That's like a whole deeper level than we really need. Um, let's see. Again, if anyone has any questions, happy to answer anything about the sculpting process. It doesn't have to necessarily be what I'm talking about right this second, because uh, again, we're doing mostly the base level of everything. Um, let's see. So subtool, yeah. So I mean, basically, you're going to be using <coughs> tool. You know, so when I'm done, I'll do save as. Don't use Control S. Uh, you can try it now, um, but when I first started using ZBrush, uh, that hitting control s to do your to save your z tool it crashed it a lot so I, I just got out of the habit of doing it entirely i always do save as um and remember this is saving the z tool not like anything else it's saving the z tool which is basically all these sub tools their sculpting information and their color information <clears throat> um say that i wanted to export say that like you know i've changed this mesh a little bit and i wanted to export this base mesh now to re uv it or something like that then you would choose export. Um, one really annoying thing that you have to remember to do is go to the export button and turn off subgroups. For some reason, I don't even know quite how this works, but ZBrush has like different like subgroups, which are not the same as subtools. Ultimately what it means is if you don't uncheck this, sometimes when you export the OBJ file, and you can actually do an MA file, uh, but I usually do OBJ, uh, sometimes it'll like export it as like a bunch of faces that are not actually bound to each other. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, I will export this to the Maya folder, scenes, uh, Twitch, OBJ. We'll do mittens low. So now if I go here, I'll go to file, import. Um, let's see where this was. So Twitch, OBJ, mittens low. So yeah, here we go. There they are. Um, if I really wanted to, you know, I could show you, uh, you know, maybe I'll export or I'll uh, extrude this a little bit. And let's send that back. Export selection. ZBrush. OBJ. Um, mittens. Altered change them so let's see what that does so this is probably going to give me the warning uh, so we'll do import uh, go to zbrush obj mittens altered so yeah it gives me this warning of the topology has changed uh, if i hit yes it's going to try to um, project everything from the old one onto the new one and if i say no it's going to import it and just delete all of my high res stuff so i don't want to do that so let's i don't want to delete so let's hit yes and just see what happens so you can see it goes through this whole process of importing that new mesh and trying to project